Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, I would like to uh, thank the uh, Eric and Sheila uh, Sampson uh, Family and Foundation for this tremendous award. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, and I would like to tell you um, a little bit about the type of research we're doing that has to do with converting heat to electricity. Um, so this is my group. Uh, uh, the, I, the, not all of them are working on thermoelectrics. We do many other things. Thermoelectrics is one, uh, one part of what we do. We also work on solar cells, environmental remediation materials, uh, and uh, uh, X-ray detector materials. Um, so I also like to acknowledge collaborators. Uh, this is a very multidisciplinary uh, effort, uh, and one cannot do it alone. One needs different kinds of characterization and measurements and theory. Uh, and so I would like to uh, um, acknowledge Vinayak Dravid, Stirad Ewer, Michigan, uh, David Seidman uh, at Northwestern, uh, Chris Wolverton at Northwestern, Stathis Polychroniadis uh, in Greece, um, Yannick Gelbstein at Ben Gurion, uh, Zhao Xing He in Shenzhen, China, and, and several others. Uh, we've been working in this area now uh, since the mid 90s. And so uh, overall, I had a, a lot of students uh, go through my groups. Uh, and um, it's a long list. Uh, uh, there's a number of students who, without whom this work would not have been possible, and also uh, postdoctoral fellows and associates uh, that have gone through the group. Again, not all of them have worked on thermoelectrics, but I'd like to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of them for the great work they have done, and the, many of them are doing really well in their careers uh, all around the world. Um, also, uh, the funding in, in our thermoelectric area has come uh, initially from the Office of Naval Research, uh, and then DARPA, uh, and NASA, and then uh, the, uh, more recently the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, so I'd like to thank them for that as well. So what is a thermoelectric? Uh, so you see uh, the thermoelectric right here on the left. Um, it's a semiconductor that can uh, directly uh, convert heat to electricity. Not, no mechanical systems are required, no turbines or anything else. It's a direct conversion, uh, and it's an amazing uh, thing to see. Uh, the picture on the left, and I'm still amazed uh, uh, when I see it. It's, uh, it's really exciting uh, to be able to do this. Uh, you can also drive this device backwards, and you can actually use it to cool by putting energy yourself, and you can actually use it as a refrigerator, and that is shown on the picture on the, on the right. Um, now, so how does this work? Um, if, uh, it's very simple, actually. If you have a, a material that has electrons that can move, and you subject this material to a temperature difference, as you see down there, the hot end and the cold end, uh, the electrons that uh, will experience the heat uh, will move uh, towards the cold end to lower their energy. This is thermodynamically required. And so once they do that, then uh, where they left from, uh, they would leave a positive charge, and when they go to, there would be a negative charge, and that would create a voltage. Uh, and so that voltage that's created, divided by the difference in temperature, is called the thermopower. So the thermopower is the key property of this, S, delta V divided by delta T. So the more the delta V, for as little delta T as you can uh, apply, the better off uh, you are in this, uh, in this business. So, uh, so now that you know thermopower, uh, let me give you a bigger perspective on, on how this could fit in the, in the bigger energy scheme. Uh, this, uh, this is a map of uh, where all the energy that is consumed in the U.S. comes from, uh, approximately 50% from coal, 17% uh, from natural gas, uh, nuclear power, about 20%. The renewables is about 10%. If you take the renewables and you analyze further, you break them down further, then you have solar, biomass, geothermal, and uh, hydroelectric all together make up 10%. Um, now, who consumes that? Uh, on the, it's on the, on the right side. Uh, so it's residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, and so on. And the yellow part. The red part, which is about 65%, is lost. It's completely lost forever as, as wasted heat. And so what we're trying to, to do, if, you, if we can harvest even a small fraction of this, let's say 5%, uh, 10%, uh, in, in its entirety, it could, make, uh, it could be equivalent to all the renewables combined. So it's a, it's a very large amount of heat. Um, uh, so uh, thermoelectrics may ha have a role to play in energy efficiency. 
Um, so here's some uh, thermoelectric applications. You can use it in uh, actually car exhaust uh, because, again, uh, in, 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 in transportation, 75% of the energy of the, uh, of the fuel is being throw, thrown out the exhaust system. Only 25% is used for the transportation. Um, automobiles, shipping, ships, anywhere you have a combustion engine, uh, you ha they have a lot of wasted heat. Um, but you can also use uh, solar energy, geothermal power, even direct nuclear to electrical conversion. Uh, NASA has actually made thermoelectrics popular and demonstrated their potential way back in the 60s when they developed uh, thermoelectrics for the Voyager program and for deep space. Um, these things are solid state devices, so if you build them properly, they can last forever. Voyager was launched in the late 70s uh, uh, and now has escaped the solar system uh, and is still se sending signals back, so, which means the lights are still on in the spacecraft and therefore the thermoelectric generator is working. It has not failed. Um, in Curiosity on Mars uh, today uh, is exploring the surface. Uh, it's powered by a thermoelectric generator. These devices have used an older generation of materials. I'm going to tell you about the new generation. Um, so uh, sustainable transportation, uh, the DOE is very much interested in it. It relates to CAFE standards. Uh, the White House uh, several years ago announced that they wanted to, have, uh, they wanted to achieve 55% uh, miles per gallon by 2025. And so recovering uh, engine waste heat uh, using thermoelectric generators is certainly consistent with this objective and it could be done. Uh, so where is all this heat? Uh, so here is a map. Uh, of an of a internal comb combustion engine, so there's a great opportunity to, to harvest a lot of this heat. There's a lot of, it's a, there's a lot of uh, energy that is being uh, generated and lost. Uh, so the goal is to integrate vehicles with a technology that will improve uh, fuel economy um, and uh, to try to do it with thermoelectrics. So the target would be 5% uh, improvement in fuel economy, uh, which may, uh, doesn't sound like much, but actually economically, it's a huge amount. Uh, this, here, this is a, a table of uh, uh, example of uh, what, uh, uh, what are the implications of saving fuel uh, in personal or commercial vehicles. So if, if you save 1% of the fuel in this way, you, ha you can have uh, uh, five, one to five billion dollar savings uh, per year. But if you can save 5%, then the savings escalate uh, to uh, anywhere from seven to $25 billion a year uh, at 5%, and, and uh, we're actually targeting uh, over 5%, close to 10%. Uh, so after many years of uh, um, research, so the private sector finally is making investments in this area. Uh, these are, uh, uh, you're seeing several uh, projects, uh, these are not all, all inclusive, but it's a, uh, there's a project going on at General Motors. Uh, there, the design is shown in the upper left. Uh, the uh, Gentherm or old uh, <coughs> American uh, company in Southern California has been working with Ford and BMW, uh, and their design is in the lower right. Uh, Alphabet Energy also is uh, working on uh, creating generators, thermoelectric generators. Uh, for this. Uh, so uh, this is the example of the uh, BMW incorporating the thermoelectric generator from Amerigo. So okay, thermoelectric power is, uh, is the key property, but it's not the only property. Uh, S is the thermoelectric power. The, uh, the way you can tell a material, a semiconductor, is any good is by this ZT value. Um, the material has to have a very high S so it goes by the square of that, that's good, but it also has to have high electrical conductivity, that's the sigma, and very low thermal conductivity, and, and that's the K. Uh, so you need to maximize, you need to do something to the material to maximize this fraction. So you need to minimize the thermal conductivity, for example, without hurting the other properties. The problem is these properties are interrelated, and when sometimes you, you raise, often when you raise one, you decrease the other, they fight against one another. And that's what makes this so difficult. Um, the ZT then is, is related to the efficiency equation in the lower right. And so the efficiency is well known and, cal and calculated. And so in this plot, you can see uh, how ZT and efficiency are related. For example, for uh, a hot source at about 800 to 900K, 
with a ZT of about two, you can expect to make a generator of about 25% efficiency, conversion efficiency. That's, ex that's very exciting because it's, we're converting low quality energy into high quality energy. And that's what uh, makes people excited in this area. Um, the old materials, the ones that NASA has been using, the ZT is about 0.7 to 0.8 in this graph. So you can see the efficiencies are about six to 7% at best. Uh, so we're looking for materials that have high thermal power, high electrical conductivity, and low thermal conductivity. The phenomenon, this is a brief history of this, the phenomenon has been very old. Uh, it has been discovered way back in 1821, uh, uh, but nothing was made of it. There were long periods, uh, the blue period, the yellow period, uh, where uh, not much progress has been made. Some progress was made in the 1950s, uh, when uh, some of the first generation materials uh, that were later used by NASA were developed, um, and that was about a ZT of one. Um, and uh, uh, after that, uh, so that was f original funding from the, uh, from the Navy in those days. Um, then NASA uh, made the generators, uh, then they couldn't make any more progress, funding declined, uh, and uh, we went through a period until the 1990s with nothing much going on until new concepts began to arise uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Dressel House and Hicks uh, reported the theory paper on nanoscale materials, um, and we finally got our first funding in the mid-90s from ONR to work in this area to make new materials for, for that. Um, in uh, 2000, we published our first paper uh, on a cooling material, cesium bismuth tellurium uh, system. But then in uh, 2004, we discovered nanostructuring uh, which uh, basically uh, pointed the way to high efficiencies because the nanostructuring was causing very large reductions in thermal conductivity without hurting the electrical conductivity. And I will tell you about that. And, and then breakthroughs were made in ZT that now we have the uh, second generation uh, material uh, of ZT of close to two or over two. For a long time, ZT uh, of one was thought to be a practical li limit Although there is no theoretical limit in ZT, one was uh, deemed to be practically uh, possible, but uh, no one was able to get over it. Uh, we were able to beat this uh, ceiling of uh, one in 2004 with 1.4, 1.6, um, and uh, uh, we generated a, a family of materials that did that. Then other groups generated their own breakthroughs uh, with different materials. And later we breached the ceiling of ZT of two, uh, with a few materials, with the lead tellurium, uh, strontium tellurium, for example. Uh, so, how do we do this? So, this is a little bit of uh, physics, but uh, I'm not going to elaborate on this. We need materials that have good conductivity, but uh, the electronic conductivity has to be uh, specialized inside the material. It has to be going not just through one, ch uh, one electronic channel, but through several channels. Uh, so, here we have... Um, um, here we have three cartoons, uh, and uh, the, the two left cartoons have the red, the red band, uh, the red electronic band, uh, that's a single band uh, of electrons doing the conduction, and the cartoon on the right has many, has four bands uh, filled with electrons, the red, the red uh, 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 curves. Um, they has up to four bands, it's a complex electronic structure, and uh, that's the type of material that will give you higher uh, efficiencies. Uh, and the question is, how do you find such a material? So why is uh, more electronic bands better than one? Um, and the answer is here. So it's like a highway. Uh, if you have one, one highway uh, and you have it's congested, then everybody is going slow because they don't want to bump into each other. So in, in, in real life, uh, in, in the electronic system, the electrons bump into each other if there are too many in one single lane. But if you take the electrons and divide them into many lanes, uh, then they can all go faster, much faster, and that's high, good for high efficiency. Um, so that's, that's one uh, key feature. The other is the thermal conductivity. You need very low thermal conductivity for, for something that will conduct electrons, and that is, uh, counterintuitive. Uh, for, here's uh, examples of thermal conductivity. So diamond is the world's best thermal conductor. 
and, uh, and it has 1,600 watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity. You don't want diamond, not just for the cost, but the thermal conductivity is too high. Uh, on the other, uh, copper, another good thermal conductor, has 400 watts per meter Kelvin. You don't want that. Um, let Telluride, which is a first generation thermoelectric, is about 2.2 watts. Now that's very low, that's, uh, that's closer, and wood is 0.2. So we want something that will conduct electrons well, have high thermal power, but have a thermal conductivity something close to that of wood. And that's what makes this so challenging. So we cho uh, we, we, we've been working with this uh, compound called uh, lead telluride. It's a nice cubic rock salt structure. And on the, uh, if, on the cartoon down in the lower right, uh, you see two blue electronic bands. And uh, that looks a lot like the other cartoon I showed you that had the, the many bands. And so um, that, that we chose that because of these two, because we wanted to put electrons there, holes, actually, the, uh, the absence of electrons. It's a different kind of carrier uh, to, to make a high thermal power system. And the upper right plot is the thermal power itself. Uh, and you see how um, at high temperatures, uh, this thermal power becomes uh, almost 300 microvolts per Kelvin, um, and that's a, that's a very high number. And the blue line, uh, it shows you where uh, the system would have been if it only was a single band system. Because it's a multi-band system, it has this enhancement, and, it, and you go up to 300. Uh, and so that's a great system. But how do we lower thermal conductivity? And that was more... Uh, quite challenging, how do we lower thermal conductivity without hurting the electrical conductivity? So what is heat? Heat is waves uh, of, the, uh, of vibrations of the lattice. So waves inside the lattice go from left to right, transporting heat from left to right. So how do you break up a wave? Uh, so well, that's where nanostructuring came in. So for example, if you want to break up waves, you put in a small islands or small artificial islands uh, in front of the harbor. Um, and you make sure that those dimensions of those barriers are close to the dimensions of the wavelength or the wavelength of the, of the wave coming in. Uh, so we, thinking similarly, uh, we were able to put such barriers inside the crystals. Uh, here, as you see, a nanocrystal having precipitated and grown inside uh, lead telluride, uh, and that acts as the barrier uh, for the heat but you see how well the crystal is placed. We call it coherent or endotaxial uh, with the rest of the matrix. And you see, if you take atomic rows in the matrix, and you can go right through the crystal without changing atomic rows. It's very well placed and ordered. And that means if you're an electron, you can go through this crystal, through, through the nanocrystal, just as well as you could go through the matrix. But if you're a wave, you can see this crystal. If the crystal is different in composition from the matrix, it must be different, then a wave of heat coming in, uh, hitting the crystal, it's a different composition, it, may, it will scatter. Uh, and that would lower the thermal conductivity. But an electron coming in, showing the nice coherently embedded nanocrystals, it can go through. And that's how you can uh, actually um, uh, lower thermal conductivity without electrical. Uh, so we proved that these nanostructures are, in fact, responsible for this uh, by making a material uh, that first didn't have any nanostructures, but it was metastable, and then we heated it up to develop stable nanostructures, and we were monitoring uh, the thermal conductivity from the state that it didn't have nanostructures to the state that it did, and we saw that the thermal conductivity was lower. So here's uh, the, green, the green sample. Uh, it's a quenched uh, melt of lead telluride, lead sulfide. We take this as metastable, it's homogeneous, and then we start raising the structure, uh, raising the temperature, and the temperature is going up, and suddenly it precipitates all those uh, uh, nanocrystals, the barriers for the heat. And so that material then, um, it's a very low thermal conductivity material. You see it in this plot, the blue point, is the thermal conductivity 0.9, so it's already very low, 0.9 watts per meter Kelvin. That corresponds to, this, to the solid solution above, the homogeneous sample. Then we start raising, um, oops. So we start raising the, 
the temperature, we precipitate the nanocrystals, and we thermal conductivity collapses down by 50%. Uh, so uh, then if you take the nanocrystals to be such that they have similar electronic levels uh, to the matrix, uh, then the electrons or the holes can actually uh, find, uh, easily um, move from one uh, through the nanocrystal without scattering. Uh, you see here the, the, the valence band, the, the bottom levels are uh, energetically aligned. The conduction band, the upper levels are not energetically aligned. So if you're there and, and you have an electron, it will scatter. So you need to align the energy levels so that you can conduct without uh, losing uh, the conductivity. So, so here's two things, precipitation of a coherent nanocrystal, but the nanocrystal has to have energy levels that are similar to the matrix so that the electrons can go through. With this recipe, you can actually make a breakthrough in ZT, which you see here in the blue uh, data, uh, that was coming up at 1.7, up from about 1.1, 1.2 of the previous generation material. This is the nanostructuring. Um, and you see the sample in the upper right. Um, but the thermal conductivity was still a little bit high, uh, too high for us. We wanted to lower it even more. And, so, and that's because um, the nanocrystals scatter thermal waves which, uh, whose wavelengths are on the order of the nanocrystal size. But what if you have a very long wave like this? Uh, like if you have a very, like a tsunami, right? It's a very, uh, very long uh, wavelength that is much longer than the size of the nanocrystal. The nanocrystal may not see that, or it may not see the nanocrystal, and it will not scatter. Uh, so we had to do something else to scatter that long uh, wave. Um, and so we were able to do mesostructuring. So we took the material and we sliced it up in very, very fine sub-micron uh, uh, particles, which were in the same order as the long waves. And so now we had sub-micron particles that themselves were nanostructured, uh, but the whole sample then could be made out of those, nanopart out of those mesoparticles, these particles, uh, this would be mesostructured. And so now we were able to knock down thermal conductivity a bit more. And you see here uh, the blue line on top says ingot. Um, uh, with nanostructuring the ingot, you get a, a drop in thermal conductivity. That's the, the, the uh, black uh, dots. And then you do the mesostructuring, and you are the red dots, and you have a much, much lower thermal conductivity as well. So when you do that, then you have another breakthrough in the ZT, and you go up from uh, 1.7 to 2.2. Um, and uh, this was, uh, so this is illustrated on the right. Uh, if you don't have nanostructuring, you have ZT of 1, 1 1.1. If you do, you go up to 1.7. Then if you have nano and meso structuring, you go above 2. And that's very exciting. You see the samples over there. This sample is big, it's bulk, it's scalable, but it's a nanomaterial. Um, and so, uh, we, so that opens uh, the door for uh, scale-up and, and uh, commercialization. So we've been working with our, uh, with our um, uh, collaborators in Japan, um, uh, Dr. Mitsuhiro Ota, uh, who has spent about a, a year and a half in my lab learning how to make these things. Uh, he's at AIST, uh, it's a national lab in Tsukuba, uh, Japan, and he has been uh, making uh, devices from this. So this is the first uh, device uh, made out of nanostructural material um, and he was able to demonstrate over 12% efficiency with a hot side uh, 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 of close to 500 degrees C. So this is a delta T of about 500 degrees C uh, and uh, uh, this is a, it's delivering 12% with a theoretical expected of close to 15%. So there's still some losses in the connections, uh, uh, both in the electrical and thermal connections uh, of this. Uh, but this is very exciting because this is the highest, uh, it's well above the six or 7%, and we, are, uh, we, we, uh, we hope that we will reach uh, uh, close to 20 uh, with, the, with the new generation, uh, this new generation of materials. So um, this is what, we, uh, what we're working on. Uh, the field is working on also other things. This is uh, some of the leading materials out there. Uh, we're not working in all of them. I, 
we just, uh, I just described the nanostructures. Um, that's in the bottom in red. That's our work. But then other people are working on abyssin telluride, antimony telluride, field scuterudides. It's another class of materials, magnesium silicide, uh, something called half Hoisler alloys, magnesium arsenic, uh, magnesium silver antimony, uh, germanium telluride, lead telluride, and, and tin selenide that we're also working on. So um, with this, uh, I hope uh, it's not too technical and uh, most of you could follow uh, the, uh, the philosophy and uh, the strategy and what we have done. And again, I'd like to thank uh, the Fuel, Fuel Choices Summit for allowing me to uh, give this talk and uh, to accept this uh, tremendous uh, award. Thank you very much.